Hello everyone, this is Zoda from Team Evil Geniuses, bringing you this video with NerdStomper.com. This is going to be the second video in a three-part series on Flint Beastwood, and it's going to be commented play of the early game. The last video covered general strategy for Flint, including item build and skill build, and the next video is going to be commented play of the mid to late game. Uh, this replay is going to be from a recent public game that I played. Obviously I play, I'm playing Flint. Uh, I don't know what's up with the icons in the replay, obviously you can, the icons for the second skill and the ultimate are kind of messed up, I hope they fix that soon. Anyway, I'll be soloing mid in this game, and my items are uh, pretty much what I said in the last video, there's no, this game isn't going to be very different from most games. So, uh, once again, that's the plus 8 agility build, so 2 duck boots, 2 minor totems, uh, runes of the blight, and a health potion. Also, I haven't leveled my first skill yet, because I'm not... I'm not sure if there's going to be a battle yet over the rune at bottom. Uh, if there, in case there is, I want to have uh, my first spell to be able to combat, just to, to fight. Since my passes are kind of useless at level one, uh, obviously my first spell has a nuke and is a slow. So I'm going to get that if there's a conflict. But if there isn't, then I'm going to level my third spell for extra range. Extra range is really important when you're soloing, since uh, basically it allows you to harass the other hero when they're not allowed to harass you. I know that sounds pretty obvious given that more range means obviously you can attack them when they can't attack you, but uh, with Flint it's particularly effective since a lot of the time if you do that then they'll be able to close the, the like the 50 range uh, 50 range advantage that you have on them in the time it takes for you to like, attack them. But uh, with Flint, the attack animation is really fast so they can't actually do that. Anyway, looks like there's not going to be a, rune a fight over the bottom rune since there is no rune. And, uh, Hag, my mid opponent, starts with illusion, obviously. So uh, I actually scaled the explosive flare here because I thought the area of effect damage would be effective against his neutrals, or against his illusions. But uh, as we're going to see, it's not actually that good. It'll, like, it'll reveal to me which one is real, but uh, it's not going to be nearly enough damage to finish out the illusions by themselves. Having the shell is nice though because it gives me a way to get creep kills. Since obviously if he has an illusion rune, it's going to be really hard to outlast hit him. Since as you're seeing here, um, getting I have like I think one creep kill and one deny after the first wave, so that's no good. But uh, one way to get a creep kills, even though if your opponent has illusion, is with spells. So against an illusion rune, if you have any kind of area effect spell that you can use, definitely use it when they have their illusion up, since that'll negate a little bit of their illusion advantage. Since uh, obviously it's easier to last hit. Uh, so in order, I guess it's easier. It's easiest to last hit with uh, using a spell. Then the next easiest would be to last hit when you have an illusion rune, and the hardest to last hit with is just with your hero. So it's pretty unlikely that I'm gonna get a creep kill if I just go for it with my attack and I'm competing with his illusions. But uh, if I'm using my spell, I'm probably gonna get it. Anyway, uh, looks like his illusion advantage is now over. So uh, with some proper timing, I should definitely be able to get pretty much all the last hits. But uh, unfortunately, I'm attacking uphill, and it looks like I'm missing like 90% of my attacks, which is obviously more than what the percent should be. So, uh, running a little bad this game, given the illusion rune and the uphill misses. But uh, hopefully, snipe Flint has a really good matchup against Hag middle. I think so. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to make up for that. The reason I think Flint has a good matchup against Hag is that uh, just his attack animation is so good that uh, it's going to be really hard for a hero with lower lowish base damage and not the best attack speed like Hag to outlast hit him uh, unless obviously she has an illusion rune but uh, now she doesn't have illusion rune so I should be getting most of the last hits honestly the best trick for out CSing your opponent uh, ranged opponent with Flint is just to wait for whenever their projectile is in the air and then once their projectile is in the air you shoot uh, you have to gauge whether or not their projectile is actually going to be finishing the creep and then uh, you just shoot yours while their projectile is in the air and since your projectile is just so much better and your attack animation is better, your projectile is going to land before theirs, so the last hit is going to be yours. Hag's actually missing right now, so uh, it looks like she actually just went to bottle a rune, uh, which I didn't notice immediately, which is why I took the extra hit from her double damage rune. Uh, but anyway, she's really low on mana, which means that even if she, like, even if she has a double damage, she's not really that fierce of an opponent, as long as I'm fully healed up for my health potion. I can probably just, like, attack her here. Even though she has DD, I can still battle her since since she doesn't have mana. She like first of all, she's kind of scared since like Hag 
really is like a caster, and if she doesn't have mana, she gets thrown off a little bit. But uh, the other problem is that uh, she, if she doesn't have mana, she just reduced to her like slow attack and can't really control the flow of the battle like, like she usually does. So uh, the reason I chose to go in at that moment and go for the kill was because, well, obviously against normally against the hag, you're not gonna be able to finish her off uh, with a hero like Flint since. Uh, she can always just flash away, right? But uh, there, it was between creep waves, and a lot of times between creep waves, people like to look back to their look at look back at the base to check the courier to like buy in the courier or whatever. And she hadn't bought her bottle yet, so it looked pretty likely to me that that's something that she would do. So uh, since she probably wasn't looking, I decided to just go for the kill there. All I needed was two attacks and a nuke, and if she w didn't react immediately, she was gonna die, and that's what happened. Actually, one thing in this game that was kind of annoying was uh, that the support hero... I mean, it's good that they bought wards for me, but uh, it's kind of annoying that they just didn't ask before sending the chick the courier middle, and now I can't actually bring... I can't bring my boot... I can't bring our marchers to myself. Now I have, I have just these useless wards in my inventory. Uh, so first, now I have to plant the wards and then get the marchers and send the middle. Anyway, Hag actually surprised me there since... Uh, obviously, I knew she was buying a bottle, uh, so I should have just immediately gone to the rune, but uh, I was just so thrown off that I got the wards instead of marchers that I sent to myself that uh, I forgot to check the rune. So always remember to check the rune, uh, especially with, even if the other guy dies, if it's early, they can spawn quickly and still beat you to the rune. So get to the rune quickly when you have a And uh, never send the courier to someone with items without first asking if they also need items, because otherwise the courier is going to be used pretty efficiently, just going mid and then going back to base and then going mid again. So since Hag has a rune, uh, it's not a good idea for me to try to play attrition with her right now since she can definitely regen more HP and mana than I can. So that's why I'm passively just sitting back and trying to out CS her. Uh, instead of like, you know, like what I was doing when I went for the kill when I used my used my nuke and then attacked her, even tanked some creeps to attack her. That's not what I'm doing right now. Right now what I'm doing is just sitting back and passively getting CS, which is what you want to do when your opponent has the rune advantage. Basically since he has the extra HP and mana, it's on him to take advantage of that. If I if I were to just like walk up to him and start like fighting him, then he wouldn't have to do any work to do that, but uh, there, he actually just used his nuke for no reason at all, and since it was going to be on cooldown, I decided to take advantage and play a little bit aggressive, which is why I changed it up, but uh, yeah, I really don't know why he used that. Anyway, uh, one concept that is important that you take advantage of when you're basically in just any 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 time you're playing a hero that has a spell that can be used on the other on the other guy, uh, you basically always want to keep yourself at exactly enough mana to cast all of your spells. And if you have like obviously if you have less than that, then and you get into a fight, then you're going to be a little short short on mana, which is not what you want. But uh, if you get into a fight and you want uh, and you have like too much mana, then that's not what you want either. You basically want to have exactly the, since you, if having too much mana is kind of a waste, since uh, if you have too much mana, then that what that means is you could have used the spell before the fight started and waited for the cooldown to get up before getting into a fight, and the fight would be more favorable for you since you just used your spell like a cooldown ago. Anyway, there uh, I was also I was using that concept and also the concept of a uh, as I'm sure I've mentioned before pushing the wave, uh, the w pushing the wave like right before the rune spawns, and since I did that, it allowed me to get to the haste rune that was bottom. Basically, uh, not only not only is it important to push the lane, it's also important to put a little bit of pressure on the other guy. So, uh, when you actually go for the rune, they're, like, if, you pro if they choose to fight you, you're gonna have a bigger advantage because you pressured them earlier. Basically, uh, all of all of my Han laning strategy is just making sure that you set, up, set, your, set yourself up for key times. So key times would be uh, when the rune spawns, and also uh, when your hero passes a certain threshold. Like if your if your hero just got significantly more powerful, or is about to get significantly more powerful, that's an important time. So you need to set yourself up for important times like that. Basically, uh, an example of that, other than the rune spawning, is a, uh, for instance, Witch Slayer hitting level six, uh, Flint hitting level six. Although I kind of killed him before that happened, so it didn't matter. Hag hitting 6 is also a key time. Uh, for instance, I played a little bit carelessly there, since if he'd actually hit his first spell, hit his nuke, then I probably would have died, but he actually he ended up missing it, so that was okay. Anyway, a lot of Han, Han landing strategies, just maneuvering, 
so that uh, when when the time comes for like an actual conflict, you're ready for it. And time the time the times for conflict are a when the rune spawns and b when a uh, hero gets significantly more powerful than it was before. So for a lot of heroes, that's right when they get their ultimate. Uh, for some heroes, it's when they hit level three. For instance, uh, Moon Queen has a pretty high chance to kill at level three, but uh, really, it's all, 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 all of laning strategy. Pretty much anything I do is just setting up for that crucial time. Everything is important. As much as you can do helps, like controlling the controlling where the lane is, uh, slow rolling your rune usage for it, um, using nukes when using nukes when they're up for that, making sure you uh, making sure you have exactly the right amount of mana, uh, harassing a little bit. Everything, basically, just everything is important. Anything you can do is important for setting up for a kill like that. Anyway, uh, it's pretty typical after you bottle a good rune like haste or invisible to gank the side that the gank the side that uh, you pick the rune up on. So as soon as I picked it up top, I went to get the gank top. Uh, the reason I didn't gank bottom when I picked up the haste there was because uh, bottom was actually really pushed out and ganking would have been pretty hard. Uh, so that's why I didn't go there. But uh, I came top with this invisible. But looks like they went in before I was ready or before I was even in range. So uh, they did get a hero kill, but they missed out on the second one. They got him kind of low, which is why I'm behind the tower, just waiting him, waiting for him to show up. But uh, he's not showing up, which is kind of confusing me. Since this rune was picked up after the six-minute mark, I'd be really surprised if they actually had wards up to see me pick it up. So uh, it's actually kind of baffling that he hasn't gotten a heal yet. Uh, there, I actually kind of misclicked on the demented shaman when I attacked. I really should have just waited. Obviously, since uh, when two heroes are there, one of which is full health, I don't want to get into a fight by myself. Uh, so I should have waited to see the situation better, maybe waited for Balfour to separate. But uh, all those plans are basically gone away since I misclicked on the Demented Shaman. It's really important for you not to do that when you're playing. Obviously, misclicking and revealing yourself while invisible the next, next to a huge amount of enemy heroes is not a good idea, and I strongly recommend that you do not do it. Anyway, uh, when you make a mistake like that, as I just did, it's important to go over why you made that mistake. So uh, this isn't this isn't going to pertain per exactly to you, but uh, it's going to give you an idea of the process that I ba basically I go through every time I make a mistake. So uh, the reason I think I made I made the mistake there is that uh, I was I was off balance because when I went invisible behind the enemy tower. I was expecting an easy kill from Balfour just walking by me, and I was just gonna nuke him and then use my ultimate. And he was gonna die. So when he didn't, sh so when he didn't immediately like walk into my vision range as I expected him to, uh, I should have just rethought, rethought the situation and just like planned out what I was gonna do uh, based on what kind of heroes came out. But that's not what I what I did there was uh, basically I just kept waiting for him. I kept expecting him to pop out and. By by doing that, I uh, clo basically closed my mind to the other other possibilities that could happen, like uh, for instance him popping out with a demented shaman, uh, which is what happened. And since I didn't like take the time to prepare myself for that happening, uh, I got thrown off. So to give you a better example, an example of what I should have done, basically for this TP top, uh, before I TP'd, I looked at the situation and what, how exactly I'd be able to help in the situation, which is why I was able to. Like use my ultimate on the correct person, and then walk in and start like use and use my nuke on the correct area and start attacking, start attacking like the right heroes immediately. Basically, uh, everything happened as I predicted, uh, which is why I was able to, I guess, which is why I didn't like choke like I did uh, in the previ in the previous scene. Here, since I expect everything that happened was expected and I had a vision of everything, I uh, I was able to basically use that to spend like one or two seconds just planning what I was going to do during the fight in my head and that goes that that one or two seconds of planning goes a long long way to stopping chokes and enabling perfect play so that fight uh, the correct target was obviously uh, engineered for my ultimate since he was the only one that I could finish off with it and he was too far away for anyone to actually do it themselves so that's why I targeted him uh, and for my first spell I hit I basically just land hit it so it hit everyone in the fight, which is where you want it to be. Uh, and I attack down, focus down, basically with sl with Flint. If you're already in range of enemy heroes, but your team is winning the fight, you always want to be hitting the lowest HP hero, I guess. Uh, that's kind of an obvious concept, but basically, 
Uh, in HOD, there's a lot of effects that can heal someone when they're not under fire. So for instance, uh, Bottle. And bottle's really the main one. There's just a lot of healing in general, so you want to be focusing down uh, heroes so they don't have the chance to basically heal a mid-fight. Anyway, here, uh, Predator actually was able to jump on me, but uh, I don't c I don't consider that a careless play since um, there's really like there's not really any I wasn't really in any danger since he was basically just jumping at me while I was near the rest of my team. Uh, what was a risky play though was continuing to channel my ultimate there while Hag was uh, in range. Basically, I didn't think she would get the idea to jump in there since I uh, this I figured I was in fog and not visible, so there's no reason she would just blink in there since she would probably just assume I was running away. But uh, it's possible that she could guess that I was channeling my ultimate there. So really the safer play would have been to run behind my tower and then use my ultimate since uh, it's not like Predator was going to leave the range of my ultimate since the range of my ultimate is gigantic. But uh, I could definitely be out of range of Hagged blinking in and finishing me off. So that's what I should have done there. Basically uh, with Flint, it's especially crucial with Flint Beastwood that you make sure that you're not getting focused by anybody. Uh, with There with Predator, I was pretty sure he couldn't jump me without dying. Uh, and he eventually did die, so I was right about that. But uh, basically, you just always want to be playing super safe, since uh, your hero isn't really that good at one-on-one -on -one encounters, but is really good at attacking while not getting focused. Anyway, it looks like my team is pushing mid, so uh, since I'm playing the semi-carry role, not a hard farmer role, I'm going to also head there for the push. Uh, I'm not going to teleport, though, since uh, teleporting to a lane just to... Like, teleporting to a lane to a re for a reason other than counter ganking or escaping is really not something you ever want to do, since uh, then your teleport will be on cooldown if you ever have to uh, escape, or obviously if you ever have to escape or counter gank a lane, uh, which actually comes up quite often. So that's why you're not going to use the teleport for any, other, any reason other than those. Uh, here I I'm pretty sure we're just going to employ the fact the reason the fact that Flint uh, with three levels and Dead Eye can outrange the tower. So um, basically, just since we have a ward that's giving us vision of the tower after the creeps are cleared, even if our creeps die, I can continue just to keep attacking the tower, and there's nothing really they can do about it, since I don't have to worry about the tower hitting me, since obviously I have longer range than it. And uh, if they go on me, then obviously I have four teammates ready to stop them, and I'm at pretty long range since that's what Flint's dead eye does. Uh, it seems like the other team has basically realized that, so they're playing really passive and just basically going for only for the deny, which is why we're able to pick up the tower kill easily. Uh, I'm not quite sure why Hellbringer initiated, although after Kraken hits the ulti, it's a pretty good fight for us. So I didn't really approve of that initiate since uh, Hellbringer's stun isn't really that long, and he ba that stun basically wasn't used to for fighting purposes, it was only used for us to like get in range of the fight, which is not really how you want a Hellbringer stun to be used. When you're stunning, when you have a, like a global stun, basically you want you want it to be you want the stun to be doing something other than like stopping them from running away when it's a five on five situations, and that's not what his stun did. The only reason it really worked is because uh, Kraken actually hit his ultimate right afterward, uh, since the enemy heroes were kind of slow running away. Anyway, if you saw there, uh, basically I would continue to stay on the edge of the fight and uh, basically just never stayed in range. Uh, I've never got in range of really anything. Uh, I was in range of Engineer's Keg for a bit, but uh, some deaf maneuvers allowed me to not get hit by that. And from there, it's a pretty simple matter. After after you're sure you're not going to be focused, it's a pretty simple matter to just cast your ultimate on heroes that are getting away and uh, use your first spell on heroes that are running into fog and just attack otherwise. Really, the everything, everything just falls into place with Flint once you stop them from focusing you. It's really the key to playing the hero. Anyway, uh, I've I'm about basically about to have my first item, so I'm gonna declare that the early game is now over, and we're entering the mid game. Uh, I'm actually gonna skip a little bit of, of uh, the free farming that I'm about to do, since uh, it's not really very interesting. I'm just hitting creeps, so uh, the next video is gonna be a little bit further in the video. Anyway, a little further in the replay. Sorry. Anyway, once again, this is Yoda from Team Evil Geniuses bringing you this video with NerdStomper.com. Thanks for watching.